the Democratic leaders' uh, weekly uh, press uh, availability, and uh, we look forward to uh, sharing some of our thoughts about some of the activities happening around the State House and around the state. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves, and then and we're going to make a couple opening uh, remarks and then open it up for questions. So Justin Alphon, President of the Maine Senate. Mark Eve, Speaker of the Maine House. Jeff McCabe, representing the community scout, he can be assistant leader. Oh, you're next. Sorry. Troy Jackson, I'm the Senate Majority Leader. And uh, running sweet tonight, uh, <coughs> Senator Ann Haskell, I am the Assistant Majority Leader in the Senate, representing a portion of Portland and a portion of Westbrook. So, we'd like to start off by just commenting that this is the first time that we are having a uh, media availability since uh, the governor has reneged on the jobs bond of 2009 and 10. And uh, we understand that the governor is busy bringing together his department heads around uh, Medicaid and, uh, and creating distractions uh, and really um, being disingenuous about uh, a lot of the conversations around Medicaid and using a lot of mis misstatements and misfacts. What we just want to focus on a bit today is, you know, once again, uh, with the governor reneging on the jobs bond, he is not strengthening Maine's economy. He's creating uncertainty uh, for businesses and for job seekers and for people who are trying to help our infrastructure. Uh, we have projects all over the state that are ramping up. Lines of credits have been drawn. And now uh, the governor has pulled the rug uh, out uh, from thousands of jobs, many, many projects. Uh, we've been hearing about them all week including up in Maine Maritime, there's a hole in the ground, uh, and they've stopped. The Maine, uh, the Maine Dental uh, School uh, doesn't know uh, kind of its future. And you could go on and on and on around jobs uh, that are being halted, projects that are being stopped because of the governor's decision to once again stop uh, bonding uh, in the state of Maine. Um, one of the things that uh, we are uh, trying to highlight, uh, because it seems like the governor does not really talk about the economy much and doesn't talk about his economic, deve economic development plan because he doesn't have one, is that Maine is still uh, the last state in the country in private sector job growth since he took over. Um, it is a dismal record. It's a record that we are not proud of and that we are trying every day to improve uh, working with our public and colleagues, but the governor uh, continues to get in the way of strengthening the economy and, the, and what he's done with this bond package is just another prime example of what he's been doing for three plus years is having great slogans really talking a good game but uh, using one of his uh, a couple of his phrases you know uh, capital goes where it's welcome and stays where it's appreciated um, I, I don't see uh, many uh, businesses looking at the state of Maine right now saying this is where I want to come and then finally, you know, he talks a lot about, you know, you know, actions speak louder than words. Um, well, both his actions and his words are hurting Maine's economy right now. And it's very, very frustrating to uh, be in this position where we have people calling us from around the state saying, what do we do now uh, with our projects that have started, have ramped up, and uh, we uh, don't know the future. And we right now don't know it either because the governor's office has basically been silent other than you know, making you know, big, big statements uh, about bond packages not going forward. So I'll pass it over to the speaker uh, if you want to add to this or just open up to questions um, or anyone else that would like to talk about, um, obviously, what the governor's done around uh, reneging on the job uh, bond that we uh, had an agreement on. I think what I'd like to do is defer to, 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 to you all the questions and just note that uh, the Barry has joined us uh, for our weekly media availability. So we'll open up the questions. I think the only thing that I want to add to what you had to say, Mr. President, I appreciate that too, is these are bonds the people of the state of Maine voted on. They voted on it because they saw that this was good economic development for the state of Maine. This isn't something we just thought up here on the second, on the third floor. These are, both, these are bonds that went out to the voters of the state of Maine. And you break a promise with them like that. These are the people who voted for these, and these are the ones that we represent. 
So I think it's important to remember that they're behind this as well. Yeah, I, I also just wanted to add, you know, as far as these bonds are concerned, you know, the taxpayers have approved these bonds for job growth, for economic development, and I think it's clear, you know, it's clear to people back home that this is another distraction by the governor. It's another overstep. It's, you know, another example of the governor being a bad CEO for the state, and it, it's just really disturbing, and I think we need to step back. We need to look. These are bipartisan bond packages. And in some of them, the governor was part of the negotiation. His staff negotiated in good faith. And he's reneged. He's broken a contract here. Yes. Um, some of the commissioners were downstairs talking about things they've had to cut over the last several years because of the Medicaid program. If Medicaid is not to blame um, for these cuts, what is? So I think that's really simple and very transparent <coughs> about what's really cannibalizing the budget. And that is the governor's unpaid for tax cuts that benefit largely the wealthy. He came up with this idea, uh, did not pay for the tax cut, and then when the bill became due, his solution was to shift this on to property tax payers of this state. Uh, it was not responsible, it was not a good idea, and it has put us in a position where our economy is weaker for it, and a reference what President Alphonse said of this governor has the worst record in the country, number 50 for creation of private sector jobs. That is. Uh, my, my interpretation of that is by, by no accident, because when you do things like don't pay for things that you want, um, you're in this situation. When you govern by intimidation, and when you govern um, by um, cho choosing my words very carefully, um, but I'll keep it to, 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 to by governing um, erratically, really, with, with the decisions around, well, these voter approved bonds are just going to pull because I'm having a bad day. That doesn't give predictability to the businesses that, that would want to come here or those that are here. So, um, so for me, it's really about poor decisions, poor planning on the governor's part around um, unpaid for tax cuts that largely been under the wealth. So I also wanted to add, as far as the governor, we talk about DHHS. And let's face it, it's been three and a half years. At every turn, there's either mismanagement, a scandal at the CDC, or something. You know, it's clear to us that the governor might need to change course. His own cost-saving measures were not working. We don't have a supplemental budget from the governor. We have shortfalls in other areas. The Criminal Justice Academy was over budget as well. So let's not just pretend this is DHHS. This is, you know, issues of mismanagement across the board. And his commissioners should be really focused on stopping press conferences, saving money, and focus on actually managing their departments. And just to further kind of talk about this issue, I mean, look, Maine is in no different, no different place than every other state in the country. Healthcare costs have been rising very dramatically across the country, and, and in the state, they have been rising too. So there's no, there's a direct correlation between, you know, Medicaid or DHHS rising, because healthcare costs are rising. And so it's very, very simple with expansion, without expansion, the rise and uh, in inflation of healthcare costs is a reality and that's happening in every state. The other thing that I think is just really, really telling of what the governor is saying right now and his commissioners is the word cannibalization. Okay, let's just, we are a cannibal. Okay, a cannibal, we, we don't need to define, we all know what a cannibal is. So let's just think about what we spend on Medicaid and how that money is spent. 90% of the cannibals are children, disabled people, and the elderly. So those are the cannibals according to Governor LePage and to all of his commissioners. 10% of Medicaid spending is for able-bodied adults, working poor adults of Maine. So if the Governor LePage wants to go around this state and talk about the cannibals, our children, our elderly, and our disabled, then good, you know, I, I want him to do that. I want him to go out and talk to our state like that because it's just really, really, for me, illustrates how much he doesn't understand this program and it illustrates how he does not really care for the people of Maine. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, really bring it back to the $400 million in unpaid for tax cuts. You know, uh, when that budget was put forward and there was no plan to pay for it and all of that money was given away in future biennia with absolutely zero plan to pay for it. Um, Democrats warned that this was a, a time bomb and that it was a bad idea. 
and there were there were uh, very tough negotiations. We were entirely in the minority, um, but the, the Republicans and the governor insisted on pushing that forward. You know, for someone who's making an average of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, that means they they got three three thousand dollars on average um, without a plan to pay for it. And for someone at the lower end, a, a mother, single mother, working full time, at minimum wage, supporting a couple of kids, she got seven dollars. You know, so it was a it was a dramatically unfair tax cut without a plan to pay for it. That's why we're in the situation that we're in now. So as the appropriations committee begins its work on supplementals for FY14 and 15, do new taxes have to be part of that solution? Is that is that one of the options that the majority will seek to explore as they attempt to close this, uh, especially in FY15, where I believe they only need a majority vote for the. Will you try to attach new taxes to that proposal? So first, we are in unprecedented territory. This is the first time that anyone ever remembers and names history that a sitting governor is not doing his job by putting forth a supplemental budget. It's unbelievable that today we have to pass a joint order to ask our appropriations committee to put a supplemental budget together. As far as the options on the table, I think Republicans and Democrats are looking at the tax expenditure committee's work, they're looking at revenue sources, they're looking at cuts, they're looking at everything that you would imagine to make sure that we can uh, look at strategic, smart, and good ideas on how to balance our budgets for FY14 and FY15, and it's going to be a fast and furious pace down in appropriations over the next few weeks because we have two budgets to put out. <clears throat> Are we on a trajectory where we could see a shutdown loom, looming? I, I mean, is that without his supplement? Without I mean, I'm just feels like he has a whole lot of work. I mean, we do, uh, but you know, other legislatures have done the work also in a short time span. The difference is again, you know, without having any guidance um, from any of his commissioners. Uh, without having a supplemental budget, we are going on uncharted territory. As far as the state shutting down, no, the state can't shut down. We're not in that position like we were in the first session. Um, what could happen is that we could have unbalanced budgets and the governor could curtail um, many parts of state government. Do you think that's his end game here? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, go, go talk to his commissioners and go talk to you know, the governor. I mean, we are going to work with our Republican colleagues and uh, allow our Appropriations Committee to do the work that they've done. And they've showcased time and time again that they can come together and they can put together uh, good budgets, solid budgets, knowing that we are working at a deficit, that we have unpaid tax cuts. We're not working with any of his commissioners. We don't have a supplemental budget, but we're going to do the best we can. So, you know, to be really honest here, we're going to be here doing the policy work. Appropriations is going to be doing the budget work. And when the governor and his commissioners want to come back from campaigning and do the work that the people of Maine expect them to do, we'll be here and they can join us. But, but you know, honestly, I mean, <clears throat> you look at this, uh, you know, remember last year when the governor ran around with his video camera talking about paying back the hospitals and how proud he was of that? Well, he ought to take his camera back out and go around right now and ask people about all these jobs that he's shelving because of the pulling back on the bonds. You know, that's what he really ought to be doing. He's, he's far better a cameraman than he is a governor, in my opinion. But, you know, here we are in this state. I mean, we only have really the opportunity of getting things back going is if we, we put people to work, and, and we have no plan for that. All they want to do is talk about how bad it is to give people health insurance and, uh, you know, that's just unbelievable that but they don't have a plan to do anything to actually put people to work. It's like, uh, you know, they're on a boat and there's people hanging on the sides and they have a paddle trying to beat them off. And, and, and that's their whole plan is to shed people. And if they drown, so be it. They don't really care. Uh, you know, and pulling back on these bonds is, is certainly the indication of that to me because this is an opportunity, a commitment we've already made. People are going to be going to work. We have uh, commitments to get people up and going. The construction industry is completely uh, obliterated at this point. They don't know at all what to do. They have no idea if their projects are gonna go forward. And, and here we are, we can't tell them one way or the other because we have a governor that doesn't care about uh, if he stays good on his word or not. 
And, and just to kind of bring it full circle, and despite uh, all of the distractions, despite all of the governor's campaigning, despite all of just the, the frustrations that you're hearing today, we have some major pieces of policy that are going together, coming together in a bipartisan way. And obviously, expansion uh, is hitting today in the Health and Human Services Committee. This has been a year-long work uh, between Republicans and Democrats coming together, figuring out how we can move this forward. And this would be just an unbelievable uh, accomplishment by this legislature, knowing that everything that the governor is doing, all the political capital that he's expending, trying to get this not to happen. And I think, you know, the speaker and many people around this table, including, you know, uh, you know Senator Cates and Senator Saviello, we, I mean, we really want this. And a lot of Republicans are joining us to make this happen. And uh, we look forward to what's going to happen in Health and Human Services later this afternoon uh, and then next week you know, bringing this uh, to the full legislature. Speaking on that, uh, last year Senator Cates offered an amendment to LD 1546 and it missed the two-thirds majority to be able to override a veto by one vote. How confident are you that you will get that in the Senate and how confident are you that it will pass through the House? Well, what we know is that with the Republican proposal that came forward this week, that we really do view this as a step forward. We need to review all the details, but the time that we've spent to look at these as it relates to the managed care and the other elements in the, in, in, in the uh, proposal, we feel like that this strikes the right balance, that, um, that there are enough Republicans in this building that this will um, satisfy some of the um, objections that we heard in the past. And, and really, I think this is a, an outstanding example for the people of Maine of what this looks like, what divided government looks like. And Senator Cates has been, has been talking about this recently, about um, you know, this, this, this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate that we can get things done on major issues in divided government. And we are all sincerely uh, hoping that that happens. We're having great conversations as we have over the past year. Um, and it's just been an incredible effort uh, having the support of the Maine Hospital Association, having the support of the Maine Medical Association, having the support of 80 plus coalition members uh, partner organizations to really um, make sure that we're telling a story of what it means to have health care for 70,000 Mainers, what it means to our economy, about a million dollars a day. We're over, we're getting, we're edging close to 60 million dollars this year that we have lost out on. It's unacceptable, it's not okay, it's a shame that the governor vetoed it last time, but I think that people are refocused on what, um, <coughs> what this current proposal means uh, for the state of Maine, both for the, the lives it covers, the economic impact, and addressing the future costs. Uh, I think in the Republican proposal, it's reasonable, it's balanced, um, and we still need to, 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 to get final uh, approval on it, but it looks like it's going in the right direction. I think that for the people of Maine, that's a, that's a bright spot. It's not too late for the governor to put this job's bond out, is it? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not quite clear on what the window is for issuing or, or having him authorize this bond. So, no, I mean, the governor can uh, rightfully and I think the correct move would be to take back his statements or just to say, you know, uh, to tell the treasurer to continue on with the $73 million that he has already signed off on. That 73 out of the $104 million that voters approved in 2009-10. So these bonds, as we all remember, were held for two years because he made up four or five different stories why he wouldn't release the bonds. And then he said after we uh, did good work together on a bond package for last November, he said he would release the bonds. And now he's now reneged them. But I believe the governor has every opportunity to work with our state treasurer and to release uh, not only the remainder of the 73, but to release the entire 104, so we can get people back to work, so we can keep these projects moving. Have some of those bonds been released? Some of the bonds have been released um, in the sense that uh, the state treasurer has released around just under $40 million. And so there's $40 million that agencies have requested because the projects uh, have got um, their uh, plans ready, shovels in the ground, and they're moving. But part of those requests might have been only 50% or 60%. So if you take an example like the Maritime, you know, they've requested their money. They have a big, big hole for a new building 
the first new building on Maine Maritime, I believe, in over 40 years. And now they're in limbo. They have money that's been spent. They've got a hole on their campus. They've got students that are planning to come there to be in this new facility. They've got faculty. They've got probably projects. They've got probably grant money. And this is just one example of probably dozens and dozens and dozens across the state where jobs are being threatened because of the governor's instability, unpredictability, and from my standpoint, just temperamental decisions uh, that uh, are hurting our economy. Just think of how hard it's going to be to get financing if you're one of those construction companies and you go to your bank or your financial institution and you say, uh, we, you know, we, we'd like to have our line of credit, we want to order materials, we want to get it on site, we want to get our people hired. And that bank says, well, what's your backing for this? And they say, well, it's, it's a bond, but the governor's kind of just keeping it in his back pocket. Uh, the opportunity for that money to flow, for those projects to get started, comes to a halt because you don't know which of those dollars are going to be available to you and which are not. And that's just unacceptable when there are people out there ready and willing to go to work that the people of the state of Maine voted for. You know, I think it's been really clear when you talk to the people who are making these investments, the business community, they just don't know how to, uh, you know, plan. The governor is just so unpredictable. So why would they continue forward with these investments? And why would, uh, you know, other people make these investments when it's really unclear what the governor's next move is? You know, he first sort of dropped this bomb uh, at the Chamber of Commerce a couple weeks ago, and it was really unclear as far as how far he would go. He has not provided any clarification exactly what he means as far as holding up bonds. This also puts into um, sort of, uh, you know, future bonds too. You know, we have other bonds that are, that are before appropriations that, uh, you know, bipartisan bonds. And what's it mean for those? Are we going to see more bonds this year or are those out the window as well? Based on what you're hearing from the sand and gravel crowd, if we were not able to get a, a, a bond package out until, say, the legislature agrees on uh, fixes for FY14 and 15, would that be too late? Would the end of April be too late to put those bonds out for for uh, pipe industries and, and other big construction companies? Well, I'll take the first half of that. Um, I, I, I think that uh, you know a lot of these uh, for, for newer projects they've got to be put out to bid. Um, so, so if, if the ground is thawed, um, you know, you're, you're losing time already. Um, and uh, we could easily lose uh, construction season, an entire construction season, if we late wait until June. But, you know, going back to what the Senate President said earlier, uh, Maine Maritime Academy, great example, they do have a hole in the ground. I learned last night they've got concrete in a hole now. And this is a world-class institution. They graduate uh, some, of the, some of the highest earning young people in the Northeast. Um, they're thrown into a state of uncertainty. The contractors working for them are thrown into a state of uncertainty and are, are faced with having to lay people off, you know, potentially, you know, next week. And in addition to that, um, you know, what do the what do bondholders in New York think about me? The, the greatest thing that the business sector needs, the greatest thing the university and the students need, the greatest thing the bondholders uh, Wall Street need is certainty. And we're throwing all of that out the door with the governor's uh, latest antics. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, honestly, I think that's exactly the point. I mean, wait till June, wait till tomorrow. I mean, we're going to 